Good morning. morning. Have a few announcements of things going on in the life of our church this summer. Our senior adults will meet for breakfast at Cracker Barrel this Wednesday at 9 a.m. We are planning a church-wide trip to the Braves game on July 18th. If you are interested in going, you can register on our website. We have had several families who have already started participating in Central all over the world. You can see these participants on the board outside the sanctuary nearest the piano. Keep the pictures coming and remember that even Noonan, Georgia is in the world. Do not, you do not have to travel outside the country, the state, or even our little own town to participate. Don't forget to post on social media and you can find the links and hashtags in our last week's challenge. And if by chance you are planning to participate in Central all over the world by going to the Children Connect scavenger hunt this afternoon in downtown, unfortunately it's been canceled. So you can participate in it on June 22nd when they have rescheduled it. We are still in need of volunteers and the donation and donations for our Bridging the Gap week. We are, doing, we are providing lunches June 24th through the 28th. Please check the sign up in the challenge or contact me if you are interested in volunteering or providing donations. Now may we join our hearts and minds for worship.
Good morning and welcome to worship at Central Baptist Church on Pentecost Sunday, the Sunday in the Christian year when we celebrate the gift, the blessing of the Holy Spirit and the beginning of the church. On that very first Pentecost, Jews gathered in Jerusalem for worship and they experienced as they worshiped the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in a way that transformed them and the world forever. We gather for worship every Sunday at Central Baptist Church because like those Jews gathered on the very first Pentecost, we believe that the shared experience of God in worship through the power of the Holy Spirit has the power to transform us. So my prayer for you and my prayer for me as we worship this morning is that God would use this hour to change our lives. I invite you to join me as we continue to worship by reading our call to worship responsibly. Come sing a new song for the day of Pentecost is here, a day when the Holy Spirit is revealed in flaming glory. Come praise the Lord for the day of Pentecost is here, a day when the Holy Spirit is given to the people. God's power, God's comfort, and God's gifts overflow to us. With joy we celebrate Pentecost. Praise God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Alleluia.
Please join me in the reading of the Litany of Pentecost. Holy Spirit, Lord, and giver of life, at the beginning of time, you moved over the face of the waters. You breathed into every living being the breath of life. Come, Holy Spirit, breathe new life into us this day. Holy Spirit, voice of the prophets, you have enlightened men and women with the passion for your truth, and through them you call your children to faithful living. Come, Holy Spirit, burning our hearts with the truth of your word. Holy Spirit, resting on Jesus as a dove, by your power Jesus came to bring good news to the poor and proclaim release to the captives. Come, Holy Spirit, abide in us and lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. You have empowered your children to be your witnesses, and uniting those of every language, race, and culture. Come, Holy Spirit, fall fresh on us today. Have the boys and girls join me in the front. Good morning. morning. Y'all all off to a good summer so far? Today is a special day at church. Have y'all noticed our new color? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love Pentecost. That's what today is. It's my favorite day of the church year. But first, let me ask you some questions. How many of you like to fly a kite? Have you ever flown a kite before? Mm -hmm. How does the kite stay up in the air? Wind. Wind. Yeah. Now, let me ask you another question. Just raise your hand if you you, um, agree with what I say. Have you ever seen with your eyes? Have you ever seen the wind? Raise your hand if you've seen the wind. Ooh, that's a trick question because we can't see the wind, can we? I see it. I see it because I can see the wind moving the trees. But can you see the wind? No, but I can see the wind moving. You just see the trees moving. You don't see the wind, do you? Because it is invisible. The wind is invisible. But just like my friends up here said, there are ways for us to know that the wind is there. First of all, the weatherman can tell us it's going to be windy today, right? Yeah. Another way is we can see it moving things like the trees. Okay. Or what about this? Did y'all see my wind? No, but you saw the pieces fly everywhere, right? What about this? Can you feel this? Yes. You can? Did you see it? No. No. Okay, but we can you, feel, feel it. it out. Yeah, you can feel it in your hair or on your back. Well, today in many churches, we celebrate the day of Pentecost, like I just said. In, on the day of Pentecost, God sent the Holy Spirit to the church. That is what we are celebrating today. The pi- Bible tells us the, the apostles were all gathered together when suddenly there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. We can also hear the wind, right? Then the Bible tells us that they, fill, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So when that wind came through, God filled the people with the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit is like the wind. We cannot see it, but we can feel it, right? We also know the Holy Spirit is there because of the presence and the feelings inside of us. And the Bible tells us that if we love one another, one of the ways we know that God is with us is because if we love one another... 
God will live inside of us. So every time we have Pentecost Sunday, you can remember it's the day that the Holy Spirit came. It's my favorite form of God because it's still with us today, right? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for sending your Holy Spirit. Even though we can't see you, we are thankful that we feel your presence in our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today's scripture lesson comes from Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. Hear these words of Holy Scripture. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, stay, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard his own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you join me now as we pray together? Dios got bog, Señor, mon Dieu, Christos, Kyrie, Jesus, Abba, Allah, Adonai. The Lord our God is one. Your name is spoken in every language on earth, and when we are silent, even the rocks and the trees will cry out. Thank you, O oh God, for breathing new life into us and empowering us to serve here at Central, in Noonan, and around your world. Thank you especially for the good work done this week by our team at Camp Hawkins. By your power, they have blown down barriers, and in a place where even speech is sometimes lacking, they have communicated through the one language we can all speak, love. May the wind of your spirit blow through our lives again today. Revive us again with the gift and the power of your Holy Spirit as we seek to become linguists of your love, make us gabby with grace, proficient in peace, and fluent in forgiveness. We ask these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
All good gifts come from you, dear Lord, and from these riches we bring these offerings. We pray that you bless not just this money, but our lives freely given in gratitude to you. Use them both in this place and wherever you take us, we pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you. Our message text this morning comes from Genesis chapter 11. I'll read the first nine verses for us. I encourage all of you to listen for a word from God to you as we read sacred scripture together. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Genesis, the first book of the Bible from which we've just read, can be broken into three large chunks. There's the primeval history, Genesis 1 through 11, of which... The story of the Tower of Babel is a part right at the very beginning. The next big center section of the book of Genesis is the story of the patriarchs. It's Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and and all of their escapades and all of their travels and all of their trickery and treachery and all of their wives. The third part, the very end of Genesis, is a story almost entire to itself, the story of Joseph. The first 11 chapters of Genesis, that primeval history, tell several big stories together, including the stories of creation, Adam and Eve and the seven days and the Garden of Eden and the naming of the animals and the the apple and the serpent and the tree and all of that, right? The next story in that primeval history is the story of Noah's Ark. We know that story pretty well, 40 days and nights and animals two by two rainbow at the end. Then there's the story of the Tower of Babel. These first 11 chapters are called the the primeval history because they kind of predate what we can locate in space and time historically. Genesis helps us locate in general terms the Garden of Eden, but, but not specifically. No one can travel to the Middle East today and say the Garden of Eden was right here. No one can say that the flood happened in this year. You don't have any idea about the interval of time between events way, way back then. There's no consensus about exactly where the Tower of Babel was built, exactly who the people were who built it, exactly what the language was they spoke before God confused them, exactly what the languages spoken were after they were confused. The stories are are prehistoric. It's hard to pin them down with dates and locations, but these are the foundational stories of our faith. They're they're in the right spot in Scripture. They ought to be right up there at the very beginning. These stories contain foundational truths about who we are, about how we were created, about our relationships, about our relationships with one another, about our relationship with God, about how we relate to the rest of creation. We pull great truths from the creation stories. We pull great truths from the flood narrative. And most of of us are at least familiar enough with those stories to understand, at least in a passing way, their connection to the foundational truths of our faith. But I think many of us are not as familiar with the story of the Tower of Babel, which stands alongside these other stories. In the story of the Tower of Babel, all the peoples of the earth lived together as one people. They shared one common language, 
one common culture, one set of customs and values, presumably one hierarchy of, of power and decision-making authority, presumably one government such as it may have been. They moved together as one tribe, as one people, and Genesis 11 tells us they were moving east when they settled in the valley near Shinar. Most scholars think that's somewhere near present-day Baghdad in Iraq. Having settled there, they came upon a great technological advancement, perhaps out of necessity. Some of us think that there wasn't as much stone east as there was west. But the people discovered how to make bricks. They no longer had to work exclusively with stone. We see in one chapter in verse 11, literally people moving out of the Stone Age and into the modern era. Tower of Babel tells the story of the discovery of the first mass-producible, widely available, regularly shaped building material. They no longer had to shape stone and work with irregular forms. They could make bricks. They were masters of their own world in ways they had never been before. It's power, right? A certain amount of hubris that comes along with that kind of newfound power, with that great leap forward in technology. Hope you're hearing some parallels between this great leap forward in technology and the technological revolution we're experiencing right now. The people said, now that we have this power, we could be like gods ourselves. Let's build a tower that reaches into the heavens. <laughs> Let's build a name for ourselves through the great city we construct. Well, God saw what the people were doing. He saw how they were using their newfound power and technology. God saw that they were using it selfishly. Let's make a name for ourselves, they said. They were claiming all the glory for themselves and failing to, to note appropriately the role of their creator and all that they were able to do and accomplish. God saw that as their power grew without, a, without an accompanying sense of humility and without an appropriate level of acknowledgement for God that, that the problem of their hubris was only going to get much, more, much worse, much more dangerous, maybe. It's one of life's greatest temptations, isn't it? To be like God, to want to be like God, to play the role of God in the world in ways that aren't appropriate? Well, God intervened to save them from themselves. God confused their languages so that they could no longer understand each other. And then God scattered them into different groups all over the, all over the globe. Different cultures, different customs, different places, presumably different races. God divided the human race so that they would never again have the power of cooperation to challenge God's power here on earth. Never again have the power to reach toward the heavens on their own. And beyond the truths we've already discovered, the story of the Tower of Babel answers Answers for ancient people without more scientific answers. Some fundamental questions about how things came to be, right? Why do we have so many different languages? How did we end up with people living in Africa and India and Scandinavia and South America? How did the world get separated into warring tribes with different languages and different customs and different histories and different expectations? Well, son, let me tell you about the Tower of Babel, an ancient father might have answered. This is how it came to be. Today is Pentecost. And Pentecost is the undoing of the Tower of Babel story. Fifty days after Easter, God sends the Holy Spirit and births the church and says... What I have scattered, let me bring back together. What I have confused, let me make clear. What I have divided, let me reunify. Where I have said, you shall not be like God. Today I say, here is my very spirit. Today you shall have the very power of God. 
We read the passage from Acts chapter 2. Do you see what happens at Pentecost? (laughs) Everything that divides us as people is knocked down. (laughs) Distance? (laughs) At Pentecost, people from all over the world are gathered in one place. Jews from every nation on the globe, Scripture says. Language? (laughs) The division of language is transcended at Pentecost as each understand the other in his own native tongue. Those gathered in Jerusalem on that first Pentecost, they they experienced this power, this miracle, this, this presence of God. Like a mighty rushing wind, we're told, and their divisions are knocked down. They experience this, and they all stand there looking at one another, amazed and asking, what does this mean? Peter stands up and answers their question. He says it means the Spirit of God has descended on us like the prophets predicted it would one day. It's happening now. So what happens when God's Spirit is present among us? That's the question of Pentecost, right? What does this mean? Well, well, let me make two suggestions, and they're both just very self-evident from the text. First, when the Spirit of God is present, it brings with it a sense of unity. And second, when the Spirit of God is present, it brings with it a sense of power. In those two ways, in bringing a sense of unity and a sense of power with it, Pentecost is the undoing of the Tower of Babel. Whereas at Babel, God saw that people were cooperating too closely and scattered and divided them. At Pentecost, God took scattered and divided people and brought them back together again. And whereas at Babel, God saw that the people's power was growing too quickly and sought to limit it. At Pentecost, God makes available a power unrivaled in the history of the world. A power, by the way, not just available to those people gathered in Acts chapter 2, but a power available to you and to me. The power of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost is a unifying power that descended on everyone gathered there. It is a power to be in a lot of ways like God. With the power of the Holy Spirit, the disciples go on in Scripture to heal as Christ healed. (laughs) They go on to baptize in God's name as Christ commanded. (laughs) They go on to speak and preach and teach with God's authority. With the power of the Holy Spirit, the disciples go on to forgive as God forgives. (laughs) To love as God loves. To challenge authority in this world as God challenges the authority of this world. They do these things with confidence and courage, knowing that they are joined by the indwelling power of God, of the Holy Spirit. And they work together in unity. Across many differences, by the way. Any student of the New Testament sees those differences almost immediately, but they work together in unity across those differences. As in God, all of creation is united in its debt and in its allegiance to a common creator. So Pentecost signals the arrival of the Holy Spirit. What will we do with it? The Spirit of God is present to help us overcome the things that divide us. At Pentecost, Jews were gathered from all over the world, different languages, different cultures, different experiences, different histories. And the experience of the power of the Holy Spirit united them. Even at this church, even at Central, where we are very much alike, we sit in our pews with different expectations. We bring different histories and experiences and backgrounds and even cultures, different expectations with us. We face generational divides. 
We may not speak different languages here, but we for sure have different languages of worship and church. For some of us, our, our church language is missions. For others of us, it's music. Some of us, it's Bible study, and it's very relationship-driven. Some of us love to hear Bach from the string quartet when they're gathered right here. Others of us can't wait to hear Blair Morgan sing a, a more modern Christian song. For some of us, worship is at its best when we're doing something new like our gifts and talents emphasis from a few weeks ago. For others of us, anything that strays from what we've come to expect represents an obstacle to worship. A few weeks ago, our, our staff got an email from one of our parents, from Becca Springfield. It was about her preschool-aged son, Henry. Uh, we got the email not long after our end-of-school-year uh, children's musical on Wednesday night here in the sanctuary. Here's what Becca's email said. I read it with her permission. Lately, she wrote, Henry's been really big into holding the door and saying, after you. <laughs> Today, in the car, I asked him why he's been doing that, and he told me. He said, remember the play we saw with the girl with the backpack at church? People were nice to her at school, and it made her happy. So I want to be nice to people and make them happy. Becca, Becca wrote, I asked him why. And he said, because that's God's love when we make other people happy. Becca wrote, it's little, but big that he's thinking about what y'all are teaching him at church and finding ways to share God's love around him. If Becca were here this morning, I would tell her that's not little at all. <laughs> and the play with the girl with the backpack, it's Mary Martin Bowen, by the way. That might not be everyone's worship language, but it was Henry's. When Henry's mom shares that email with our staff, and now as I share it with you, Henry's language might not be our native language, but we're all understanding it now, aren't we? It's the Holy Spirit at work. A few years ago now, Julie and I were we're down at the Gulf Coast for vacation, just on the Florida side of the Florabama line, Perdido Key, Florida. Uh, we're just on the other side of the bridge that goes over toward Orange Beach and Gulf Shores, Alabama. A few mornings while we were there, I, I got up in the morning to run for exercise. I ran down the beach road a little ways. My, my goal each day was to run over that bridge a few miles to the bridge and over it and back. First day I started running, I got to the bridge a couple miles away, and I felt really great. <laughs> I'd kept a pretty good pace to get there. I, several miles in, I wasn't tired or winded. I felt as fresh as I had when I'd started. Felt like I could keep that pace up forever, and I, I ran over the bridge. And getting over that bridge requires a pretty sustained little uphill effort on the uphill side of the bridge. And even after that, I still, I still felt really great. Thought to myself, man, vacation is really doing wonders for me. Relaxed. And then I turned around to run back. And as soon as I turned around to head back over the bridge, I felt a, a strong wind in my face. I thought, thought for sure the strength of the breeze would subside when I got over the bridge and back down on the other side. But, but back on the road on the other side, the breeze just got stronger. It was hard work running into that breeze. Eventually, I had to stop and walk the rest of the way home. And I realized why the run out to the bridge had been so easy. <laughs> I'd had the wind at my back the whole way. <laughs> the wind was helping me every step of the way, but I, but I couldn't feel it. I was moving with the wind, so I didn't notice it at all. But when I had to run against it, it felt like I was running into a hurricane. <laughs> at Pentecost... 
the Holy Spirit arrives like a mighty rushing wind, and it's got some power behind it. (laughs) When we're running with the Spirit, that wind has the power to unite us and carry us into God's future together to do God's work in the world. The work of Babel on the day of Pentecost has been undone. What had been scattered and divided is being gathered back together again. The differences that divide us are being overcome by the power of God's Holy Spirit. For some of us, unity across differences in all kinds of ways. For some of us, that's uncomfortable. But it is the direction of the Holy Spirit. It is the work of God at Pentecost. And running into that headwind is a losing proposition. The mighty wind of the Holy Spirit is hard to work against. But as a helping wind, with the Holy Spirit at our backs, there is nothing we can't accomplish for God in the world. Thanks be to God for the indwelling power and the enduring presence of God's Holy Spirit. We don't end services at Central without giving you a chance to respond to the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit. We don't end services about giving you a chance to respond to the ways God may be working in your heart and in your life. There's a way you would like to respond publicly this morning. I would invite you to make that decision known by meeting me at the front as we sing our departing hymn together. few things as we go this morning. Number one, please remember, I'll echo Katie's comments from the beginning of worship. Uh, Central all over the world, keep those pictures coming in. Check out the board out in the hallway if you haven't already. And you do not have to travel halfway around the world to be part of Central all over the world. We remind you guys every week in worship that you carry Central with you out into the world wherever you go. So take Central to the pool with you. Take Central to the lake with you. Take Central to lunch at Redneck across the square with you. Take a picture of it and send it back to us, and we'd be happy to share it with, you, with the rest of our congregation uh, here in our Central All Over the World board right here. Also, remember, uh, what our first summer social is coming up. Uh, ice cream at the Chronics coming up in just a few Sundays. If you're going to be here that Sunday, just a, a no-frills, fun chance to get together as a congregation for fellowship and fun. Uh, bring your homemade ice cream with you, and uh, we'll have a great time together that evening at the Chronics. Uh, finally, we are a missionary people. Steve mentioned our group from Camp Hawkins. We're grateful for the work they've done this week. Uh, we will be, have the opportunity to welcome our Dominican partners in worship next week. We'll uh, have an opportunity to hear from them. If you're interested during the Sunday school hour, an opportunity for them to help lead us in worship as well as they're here next week. We're also working to have uh, Pastor Tony from Cuba be with us here later in July. Uh, we're grateful for all of the ways we partner with uh, uh, other Christian leaders here in our community and all over the world. Uh, In that vein, we're sending a group of teenagers on a missions trip beginning this Saturday. Uh, They will go as our representatives to work in New York City. Uh, If you're here this morning and are going to be part of that trip, I would invite you to come to the front uh, with me right now and let's say a prayer together.
Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we send our youth missions team uh, with our blessing, uh, knowing that they go with yours as well. We're grateful for the sacrifice of time and energy and resources that their going represents. We pray that you will use that sacrifice. Uh, Allow them to be your hands and feet, your voice and presence uh, to people in New York City in a way that you would not otherwise be present without their presence there. We send them joyfully. We ask for your providence and protection as they travel. As they are our representatives that you bring them home safely to share uh, your story of their work there. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.